I don't know about you, but I often find that many of my favorite fictional stories have one thing in common that they do rather well, world building, which I like to sum up as the act, art, and process of creating a unique world. Whether it's a different time, a different place, or in the case of HBO's new series, Watchmen, a familiar time and place, but an alternate history and reality, world building is an integral part to storytelling. In this video, I'll be exploring a few of the ways that Watchmen introduces us into its peculiar world, a world that was first imagined over 30 years ago. The show is inspired by the 1986-87 comic of the same name by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, a story of the crackdown of vigilante superheroes against the backdrop of an escalating cold war between the United States and the Soviet Union. All the while, the doomsday clock ticks closer and closer to midnight. Not only is Watchmen considered a masterpiece of its medium, it's considered by many, myself included, to be one of the greatest books of all time. Despite being largely set in and around a recognizable New York City in October of 1985, the comic works to paint a world of differences. In addition to the plot unfolding page by page, the world itself unfolds around us panel by panel, often in the background, foreground, or in a passing frame. The graphic novel was adapted to the big screen in 2009 by Zack Snyder in a mostly faithful adaptation, a film that has plenty of detractors and proponents alike. I stake my tent firmly in the latter camp, but for the purposes of this video I'm going to be ignoring what I consider to be Snyder's masterwork and focusing on Damon Lindelof's spin on things. which he has notably called a remix on Moore and Gibbons' source material, though for all intents and purposes it seems to operate as a sequel set decades later in 2019, a year that is near and dear to us all. But the 2019 on display in these first episodes is like looking into a funhouse mirror, a reflection full of distortions and fascinations, a portrait that is part likeness and unlikeness. The result is uncanny. In order to bridge this divide for viewers, Lindelof and the rest of the writer's room were tasked with the act, art, and process of creating a unique world. World Building the series accomplishes this first by grounding the narrative in actual history. The first two episodes feature cold openings that take us back nearly a hundred years to find historical footholds to establish one of the show's most mysterious characters. The premiere hits the ground running with the horrific Black Wall Street Massacre, a real event that many of us are now learning about for the first time. In the second episode, we see the origins of a German leaflet that was dropped on African American soldiers in the First World War. Once again, this actually happened. By acknowledging and shedding a light on dark chapters of our past, the show establishes a shared history before imagining an alternate reality, which itself has plenty to say about our world today, albeit with plenty of sci-fi garnish. With its unpleasant foundation set, Watchmen then dropkicks us into an alternate modern day where the variations from our own perceived concept of modernity immediately stand out. Battery-powered cars, masked police officers, and locked holsters for said officers. In just a single scene, the world building is already well underway, and synapses in the viewer's noggin are already popping off. We automatically begin to construe this information. For example, while electric cars are in actuality in our reality, they don't look like this. In fact, well, maybe I should say, in this fiction, cars have been electric for decades thanks to Dr. Manhattan, the only superhero in this universe who is actually super that we know of. We can also start to imagine the conditions and situations of a world where police identity is concealed and their ability to use deadly weapons is policed itself. A bizarre combination that leaves them simultaneously protected and vulnerable. It may seem a far cry from the headlines of our 2019, but I think that's the point. At best, these peculiarities drive the viewer to start filling in the rest of the painting, or they could just frustrate the viewer due to sheer lack of explanation, which I imagine is one of the skills on Lindelof's LinkedIn profile. File. It's here that writers faced one of their trickiest of tenants, show, don't tell, an adage dating back to Chekhov that has become a built-in cliché for screenwriting instructors and film critics alike. Granted, this spiffy golden rule is somewhat semantics. It doesn't and shouldn't mean avoiding dialogue and treating your work like a silent movie. It means finding the right balance and in delivering information to the viewer. Show Don't Tell is an applicable guideline for many facets of storytelling, but is particularly apt in world building and conveying pertinent background intel. This leads us to discussing the seemingly necessary evil of exposition which Watchmen has some creative solutions in providing. It finds ways to show and tell. 
flash forward a third of the way into the pilot when we are first introduced to our protagonist, Angela Abar, presenting at a career day in her adopted son's class. This makes a good excuse and situation for a character to speak plainly about her own past and the world itself. Maybe you can explain to him what they're eating. Oh, um, it's called a bonbilla. When I was a little girl in Vietnam, we called them mooncakes. And were you born there before or after it became a state? And it helps when you have another character there to ask questions that also contain information. This shot in particular is a solid example of show and tell. Only slightly out of focus in the background, we learn actor-director Robert Redford became the president of the United States in the 90s and the Watchmen timeline. A not-so-subtle clue that is quickly built upon when a student brings up the term Redfordations. Mm -hmm. Did Redfordations pay for it? Excuse me? And later, at the Nixonville trailer park, which in and of itself says a lot, when Angela passes some graffiti. Or later still, when we see protesters outside of the Greenwood Center for Cultural Heritage. Furthermore, it helps to have characters and devices that operate in an expository manner. Take, for instance, Panda, a character we first hear about. I need weapons off of who's on the desk. Panda, I'll pass you through. Shit, no, wait, is there anyone out? Then here. This is Panda, what's up? And eventually see an emergency 24-hour release of deadly weapons we all know people who operate under a strict letter of the law mandate and it makes sense that such a stickler could be found on the tulsa police force he's a character who can literally read the rulebook aloud and get away with it similarly angela's visit to the greenwood center is led by the plot as she tries to discover the identity of the old man she has taken prisoner an intention that is waylaid by bureaucratic protocol and a force-fed history lesson. In the space of a single day, it was all gone. The Tulsa massacre resulted in profound loss of life, not to mention the property and treasure pillaged from its victims. The character might not need it and expresses as such, but it's all in service of the world building. The show and tell coalesces for one of my favorite scenes from the first episode, Looking Glass's interrogation of their terrorist suspect in the pod. Throw interrogations, interviews, and the like on the list with career days as effective venues for exposition. A mix of meaningless questions, What did you have for breakfast this morning? Baffling questions, If I defecated on the American flag, how would that make you feel? and repeated questions. Are you a member of, or do you associate with members of the white supremacist organization known as the 7th Cavalry? Are you a member of, or do you associate with members of the white supremacist group known as the 7th Cavalry? Help define the characters in the room and the state of the world outside of it. What's more, the dozen or so visual clues, such as Nixon's mug on Mount Rushmore, further paint the alternate landscape. Way back in the distance. There they are. As with most narratives based on existing properties, you're going to get the most out of it if you're already familiar with this universe. For example, viewers who don't know a thing about Watchmen might be completely confused as to why thousands of baby squids fall from the sky midway through the first episode. The unindoctrinated might be looking skyward wondering, what the fuck? But even this is used to flesh out the world. Our characters hear sirens and they know what that signals even though we don't yet. Topher looks up, cluing us in on where the event is coming from. We see civilians reacting by pulling over in their cars, getting out their umbrellas, or futilely holding a bag over their head. In a world where it rains squid, you always keep a squeegee in your back seat. And it's probably not going to smell great. It smells. It reminds me of an exercise found within the creativity sparking pages of Roger Von X, a whack on the side of the head. What would happen if gravity stopped for one second every day? What would things be like? What would land surfaces look like? How about oceans and rivers? How would life have developed under such conditions? Would living things have special zero gravity adaptive features? How would buildings and houses be designed? How about your furnishings? This is basically a world building exercise, a what if question mined for utmost potential. Similar questions could be asked of any incredible occurrence, you know, like raining squid. Just look at how many questions and answers this sequence provides. In the next scene, we see Angela's husband and daughter hosing off the walkway and a street maintenance truck with a squid-like emblem pass by. More explanations as to how this inconvenience is dealt with in daily life. Also, you'll notice the 51 star American flag, something that doesn't fly in Nixonville. You will tell me that Tulsa, Vancouver, Chicago, and Leningrad all at the same time. I don't know. 
I'm not a scientist. It's in the dimension. No, 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 no. It's a false flag. Man, look. It's red for raining down these baby alien squid on us. So we stay distracted while he and his lip stop him. Take away our rights. Newspapers play a big role in the graphic novel. Headlines clue the reader into past and present goings on in the world, and they are prevalent, carried by or read by characters, laying on someone's desk, or even discarded on the sidewalk. And it's here that the medium of comics really shines through, because the reader can take as long as they want on each and every image, even reading every word that doesn't fall into a narrative box, speech, or thought bubble. Something that doesn't always translate well into the medium of the moving image. Does she really read all of these? But that hasn't stopped Lindelof and team from littering them into the show so far. And while most people won't be able to catch much on an initial viewing, there are some details to glean if you painstakingly go through a scene frame by frame. You know, like if you're making a video essay or something. So let's pour one out for the two people who were killed by Squid Shower in September and start placing bets on who the next president will be. It's not the most effective form of world building on screen, but it's a nice touch, and it's often the little things that add up. Like the choice to include a TV show within the TV show, similar to how the original includes a comic book within the comic book. While this is certainly employed to draw thematic parallels between stories, it's also a form of, you guessed it, world building. I mean, why should storytellers stop at imagining the geography, history, politics, ecology, and economy of their created world when they can further comment on it through the fictional art and entertainment of such a world? Because this is an alternate reality with a shared history, we see some overlap, such as Roger and Hammerstein's Oklahoma, and some equivalents. Instead of American Horror Story, they have American Hero Story which serves to introduce us to some of the masked vigilantes from America's past while also poking fun at Snyder's adaptation. Veidt is even reenacting key moments from the graphic novel in his sadistic homebrew theater, which reminds me of season 6 in Game of Thrones when Arya watches the dramatization of her father's death. It makes sense that big events would find their way onto the stage or whatever medium where stories within stories could plausibly take place. The Watchmen series even begins with a fictional silent film, Trust in the Law, which could very well be the origins of the masked vigilante. Young Will Reeves is clearly enamored by it. There's actually more to learn about Trust in the Law, and several other topics that the show merely skims over on PDpedia, HBO's online companion which is essentially a canonized lore dump. So far, they've been dropping a few entries per episode. This too is inspired by the comic, wherein at the end of most chapters, supplementary material was provided to further realize the world in service of the story at hand. In the graphic novel, these range from excerpts from Hollis Mason's autobiography Under the Hood, a copy of which can be seen on Chief Crawford's desk in the first episode to a new Frontiersman cover story on the editor's desk. On PDpedia, you can read up on reparations, Rorschach's journal, and even the state of technology in this alternate 2019, a world that is simultaneously two steps forward and two steps back, where airships and flight suits are a thing, despite the internet being in its infancy and nobody having cell phones. Do you guys not have phones? None of this is required to appreciate or enjoy the story. It just offers a deeper dive into the world for those who want to take it. Similar to how J.R.R. Tolkien filled the back pages of The Lord of the Rings with maps and appendices. These are just some of the methods Watchmen has practiced world building in his first episodes. Not to mention the numerous ways that characters from the original have been interpreted or otherwise left their mark on this world. I expect these will continue to pan out in interesting ways in addition to whatever else Lindelof and company have in store. What are your favorite examples of world building in Watchmen? And what do you think of the show so far? Let's make this a conversation in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Subscribe to Cineflect for more video essays, reviews, lists, and other cinematic experiments. And consider clicking that bell next to the subscribe button to be notified anytime I upload a new video. For Cineflect, I'm JS Lewis. Until next time, watch The Watchmen.